Good afternoon and thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you this afternoon. Uh, for those of you in the audience who don't know me, my name is Kate Tatton Brown and I'm a medical geneticist in London, UK. And I'm really sorry not to be with you all. Um, I'm sure that were we uh, face to face in the Rocking Horse Ranch, there would be many faces in the audience that I would recognise. So hello to everyone. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, our work on DNMT3A and TBRS and really that journey from gene discovery through uh, clin clinical clarification and our recent work on obesity and TBRS. This is an outline of my talk today. I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, giving you the background to my work. Before then, I'm going to detail our study into the gene discovery, so how we identified gene MT3A. Before then, I will talk about the clinical features associated with TBRS and our recent work on obesity. And then I'm going to wrap up by considering um, some suggested management guidelines in TBRS. So I started working on the overgrowth intellectual disability or OGID syndromes uh, more than two decades ago now. Um, initially, uh, we did the work under the auspices of the Childhood Overgrowth Study, but we recently rebranded this as the OGID study to reflect the adult as well as paediatric participation, but also because I had moved professionally from the Institute of Cancer Research to St George's University and St George's Hospital, which is where the OGID study is now based. The study is an international study and we have recruited over 2,000 families worldwide and individuals are eligible to participate in the study if they have overgrowth, which we define as height and or head circumference, at least two standard deviations above the mean. And two standard deviations equates to around about the 98th centile um, and above on the growth charts. And you'll see that here on the growth chart on the right. Uh, children should also have an intellectual disability to be eligible for the study and other problems um, which have uh, been present from birth. And there are three main aims to the study. The first is to identify new genetic mechanisms of the OGID syndromes. Then we aim to delineate the associated clinical features, which we call uh, the phenotype. And then finally, um, this research uh, isn't worth much to families and patients unless we effectively translate our findings into the diagnostic laboratory and the clinics. And this is a cartoon of our achievements over the last two decades. I'm not going to go into each of these in detail, uh, but today I'm going to talk about our work on DNMT3A and TBRS. Really thinking about, first of all, the gene discovery and then the phenotype and then the obesity study. So we identified DNMT3A back in 2014. And uh, we were very fortunate in our laboratory in that we had access to very new technology, which is called whole exome sequencing technology. We're now um, really using that quite frequently in the diagnostic setting. But back in 2014, this was uh, really at the cutting edge of, of new innovations. And this allowed us to sequence all the genes in uh, two individuals who we felt looked quite similar to each other. And we identified that those two individuals had uh, variants uh, which disrupted the normal functioning of a gene called DNMT3A. Having identified these DNMT3A variants, these two individuals, we extended our analyses and were able to identify another 11 individuals with DNMT3A variants, bringing our uh, total number of individuals with DNMT3A variants to 13. And these findings were published in Nature Genetics back in 2014. So I just want to take a few steps back to really think about what I'm describing here. So DNMT3A is a gene that is located on chromosome 2 at chromosome position 2P23.3. So I'm going to think about what a gene is. I'm then going to think about what a chromosome is, and then I'm going to think about what we mean by this position 2P23.3. So this is one of my favourite schematics. This is DNA, and DNA is a twisted ladder-like structure, which we also fondly refer to as the double helix. 
And uh, the rungs of that ladder are made up of combinations of these four bases, A, T, C and G. So A stands for adenine, T for thymine, C for cytosine and G for guanine. And A always marries up with T and C always marries up with G. And one of the things I find absolutely fascinating is that the complexity of human form comes down to different combinations of these four bases. And a gene is a piece of that DNA that encodes for, uh, a, is a heritable unit that encodes for a protein that allows the normal functioning of the body. And our DNA is uh, microscopic and uh, is, so we can't see it with the naked eye, but it is packaged within the cells as chromosomes. So this figure here shows you that that twisted ladder-like structure is in itself twisted around protein balls called histones, which make up these chromosomes. So chromosomes are made up of DNA or made up of our genes. And this is a cartoon showing our chromosomes. And you'll see that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And these are numbered from one, which is the biggest pair, through to 22, the smallest pair. And then the third chromosome, third, 23rd pair are our sex chromosomes. So males have an X and a Y, and females have two X chromosomes. And DNMT38 sits on chromosome two. More specifically, it sits on the short arm of chromosome two, which is P, the P arm, P for Pettit. The long arm is called Q, which is really called Q because it comes after P. And the 23.3 relates to that striping or banding pattern on the chromosomes. And DNMT3A gene encodes the DNMT3A protein, which stands for DNA methyltransferase 3A. And this is an epigenetic regulator. And this orchestrates uh, the, uh, the putting on of methyl groups onto DNA. And it's specifically um, involved in the de novo methylation. So the first lot of methyl groups that are, are applied to DNA. And these methyl groups uh, act as switches which determine whether or not a gene is switched on or off in a cell and at a given time. So really, DNMT3 has this phenomenally important uh, role in orchestrating the expression of genes in different cells across the body. So I'm now not going to move on to our clinical study, and I'm going to present our work from uh, 2018 when we investigated the phenotypal clinical features that were described in 55 individuals who participated in our study. I should mention at this point is that we're really hoping to update these data with uh, the imminent launch of the, the patient registry. And so we'll be able to prospectively curate that data and really um, build and develop the information that we are feeding back. But through this 2018 study, we were able to show that TBRS is uh, characterised by the clinical triad of overgrowth, intellectual disability and a characteristic facial gestalt. And I'm going to talk about each one of those three in turn. Every individual in the study had a degree of intellectual disability. Most commonly, people were described as having a moderate intellectual disability. And these are broad groups. An individual um, in the mild group would be expected to uh, need some support at school, but would likely uh, manage OK in the mainstream setting. And as an adult would be likely to manage independently, but again, with a little bit of support. Where an individual was, um, had, was described as having a more severe intellectual disability, we would expect that they would need considerably more support at school and would likely need to be in the special educational needs setting and then would be unlikely to uh, live independently as an adult. And then individuals with a moderate learning disability really sit between, between those other two groups. So if we move now on to overgrowth, 83% of individuals had some degree of overgrowth. And remember that we define overgrowth as a height and or head circumference, at least two standard deviations above the mean. 
And if you look at these charts here on the right, you'll see at the top we have height, head circumference and weight. And the red, uh, the orange line that has just come in is, is that cutoff of two standard deviations. So you can see that a considerable number of people um, have a height and a head circumference and a weight above that line. But uh, it should also be noted that there are 17% of individuals who have neither the height and the heads or the head circumference above two standard deviations. So this is really important for clinicians to be aware of because if a, a, a child or an adult that they are looking after doesn't fulfill those overgrowth criteria, that does not mean that they do not have TBRS. So if we now move to the characteristic facial appearance associated with TBRS, um, this is really subtle and uh, I think would only really be recognised by uh, uh, someone who is uh, familiar with TBRS and I think becomes more apparent as children grow into the early teenage years. And the facial features that we would say are characteristic of TBRS include a round facial shape, Often uh, eyebrows are quite heavy and horizontal. The space between the upper and lower eyelid is, is small, so we call that narrow palpable fissures. And many individuals with their secondary dentition have quite large, prominent up um, top frontal incisors. And there are a number of other associated clinical problems. The commonest by far is joint hypermobility, which affects nearly three quarters of individuals. But hypertonia is also common in just over a half, and that describes a floppiness. Often that is present in the neonatal period. Just over half of individuals also have some behavioural issues or neuropsychiatric issues. And by far the most common behavioural issue is autistic spectrum disorder, although um, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is also common. The neuropsychiatric issues aren't quite so frequent, um, but can include depression, anxiety, and then uh, a couple of individuals have also had psychosis. About a third of individuals have uh, kyphoscoliosis, which describes an S-shaped curve to the spine, either a left to right S-shaped curve or a front to back S-shaped curve. And then about a fifth of individuals have um, afebrile seizures. So that seizure is not associated with an increase in temperature. And then finally, I do need to mention here that it appears that uh, AML or acute myeloid leukemia is reported at an increased incidence in TBRS. But currently, we don't know what that incidence is. And it's, it's uh, likely to be uh, around very much the minority of individuals. But we're working very hard at the moment to try to quantify this. And then in this uh, 2018 study, it became apparent that uh, a number of individuals also struggled with their weight. So uh, this year, we have been really trying to do a deep dive into this to understand about obesity, um, really thinking about the incidence of obesity in TBRS, the patterns of weight increase and the eating behaviours. And thank you very much to those 97 of you who participated in this study. Um, it was a really, really great completion rate. So um, I am deeply grateful to you. And it is only because you completed these surveys that we've been able to curate these data. So if I start by thinking about the incidence of obesity, uh, about 60%, 65% of individuals with TBRS had either increased weight or obesity. And we align the definitions of overweight and obesity to those uh, dictated by the World Health Organization or the WHO. And we can talk about that later um, if you are interested. So you'll see here on the pie chart that nearly 41% were described as having obesity and nearly 24% as being overweight. What was interesting is that the onset of obesity seems to be much younger than what we had originally thought. So in our 2018 paper, we thought that actually the onset of obesity was in early teenage years. But the data from this study showed that actually it was much younger than that and that uh, the growth data suggested that onset was less than five years. 
And then when we uh, asked families to report when they felt that their children first started increasing in weight, it was really less than three years of age that there was that initial weight increase. So this is very early onset obesity. So we then looked at uh, eating behaviours that might be driving um, the increase in weight and the development of obesity. And we investigated this using the validated Dykins questionnaire that was first developed to investigate eating behaviours in Prader-Willi syndrome. And underpinning this Dykins questionnaire are three pillars which investigate hyperphagia or that increased eating behaviour. The first is hyperphagic uh, behaviour, which is thinking about the behaviours around obtaining food. So the questions under this pillar include how clever or fast a child is, is in obtaining food, how often a child will bargain or manipulate in order to get more food, how often a child will try to steal food, how often they get up at night to seek out food, and how often they forage through rubbish or trash to find food. The second pillar is the hyperphagic drive, and the questions under this pillar are how upset does your child become when denied food? Once food is on their mind, how easy is it to redirect them away from food? How persistent are they in asking or looking for food when told no? And what is their level of distress when others stop food talk or behaviours? And the final pillar really quantifies uh, the hyperphagic severity. And the questions around that are what time is spent talking about food or engaged in food behaviour? And what extent does food interfere with functioning and daily routines? And when uh, we asked those questions under the, uh, these three pillars to the families that uh, participated in the study, what we found is that for each of these three groups, there was significant increases in the in the groups where the children had uh, increased weight or obesity. And so really hyperphagia across those three pillars was uh, significant. And we looked at other things that might be compounding this, such as uh, the age or the, the uh, intellectual degree of intellectual disability autistic spectrum disorder or gender, and it seemed that uh, they were not influencing the, the hyperphagic behaviour here. So they, they were independent of that. So that was quite interesting that individuals with TBRS do seem to have a, an, an abnormal relationship with food through hyperphagia, although this is probably not the entire story and there are other factors at play as well. So to wrap up, I just want to think a little bit about how we might approach the management of TBRS. And I think we need to think about how we manage someone who at initial presentation and then how we manage someone in follow up. So I would suggest that anyone who first presents with TBRS is a baseline echocardiogram to investigate the structure of their heart and make sure that there are no heart abnormalities there that um, haven't yet been detected. I would also recommend, because hypermobility is so very common, that uh, children and adults have input from a physiotherapist or a physical therapist, as you call them in the US. And then uh, individuals should be regularly followed up, and I think at least annually and perhaps more frequently if they have more complex issues. And uh, that referrals and management should really be bespoke and reflect individual need, but are likely to be around behavioural issues, psychiatric issues, management of kyphoscoliosis or seizures, and sometimes individuals have dental issues that they need follow up with. And then uh, I think it's important to have ongoing cardiac follow up through a uh, cardiologist with echocardiogram and ECG, because we're really learning about um, the, the cardiac phenotype in TBRS and whether there are um, abnormalities that may present a little bit later. And then reflecting the work that we've recently done on obesity, it's really important that there are lifestyle and practical interventions really to try to mitigate this as much as possible. And in the discussion, we could perhaps um, touch upon whether perhaps there might be a role for pharmaceuticals in the future. And then because we think there is this uh, uh, slight increase in tumour incidence in TBRS, it is important to think about tumour screening. But this really does need to be 
uh, any surveillance needs to be a consensus agreement and it would be helpful if this could be internationally ratified and work is being done in this space at the moment. So I've talked to you a little bit about our work on the OGID syndromes and how uh, we identified DNMT3A and then looked at the clinical characteristics of TBRS and we were able to define that clinical triad of intellectual disability, overgrowth and a characteristic facial appearance. I've also talked a little bit about our recent work on obesity and TBRS and how the obesity is driven to an extent by this hyperphagic behaviour. Um, but I have real hope for the registry, which is just launching with Nords now. And I really hope that this will be such a powerful tool to really uh, extend and build on our clinical knowledge, which will in turn help us to inform the management guidelines that uh, we, we provide and will hopefully ensure there's consistency of approach to TBRS internationally. And then we will, of course, be publishing our data on obesity in the near future. So all that remains is for me to say thank you very much for listening and to acknowledge all my colleagues who have contributed so much to all this work over the last two decades. But I really wanted to give a massive shout out to you families in the audience and uh, to look back on our face to face days at the Rocking Horse Ranch and hope that we will be back there in the not too distant future. So thank you for listening and I hope that we can uh, now meet each other live and have um, some good discussion around uh, some of the questions that you might have. Thank you very much.